Okay. okay. Very good. Excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us for this month's Next Steps program in celebration of Preservation Week. Presenting today is Mark Melamit. Am I pronouncing that? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> He's a Tech no. <laughs> 5 at Nanakuli Public Library, and he will demonstrate his style for processing books and DVDs for longevity. And then after him, we have Cynthia Ingle, who is, who is a certified archivist and a and the executive director of the Hawaiian Historical Society. Currently, she has the honor of serving as the president of the Association of Hawaii Archivists. Cynthia obta obtained an MLISD from the Uni University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she became a member of Beta Phi Mu. Her passion is connecting collections to the community and is dedicated to preserving historical materials and collaborating to develop engaging programming and out outreach services. Her uh, presentation is called Don't Bug Out, Cost-Effective Preservation Techniques for Your Library. Um, without further ado, we're gonna have Mark start us. I'm gonna switch over. Okay. okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm hailing from Monocoli Public Library. And today I'm gonna present to you um, some processing for DVDs and some manga. And some other special, if I have time, some, I'll show you some other special um, considerations for processing uh, books and materials. Now, I want to start with the DVDs uh, because there's not as much to show uh, with that. And then I'll go into the manga because I think there's a little bit more that needs to be covered with that. So um, Sharice had, had asked me to do the presentation because she thought it was impressive how, how we handled um, our DVDs. And one of the things that um, was a problem for, for me uh, as a tech processing materials was that I was constantly finding myself repairing things and not and, and taking away time from stuff that was new and getting more new materials out. So uh, I'm, I'm going to show you um, what my thinking was behind that and, and why. Um, I'm going to have to tilt the, um, the iPad down so that you can see my workspace. So um, I'm going to try and do this slowly so you don't get busy or whatever, but hang in there for a second while I do this. I'm just going to tilt this down so that we can see what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So um, this is one of the DVDs that um, that I did process, and it circulates now. It has in it some foam inserts, which help to prevent the the disc from being uh, crushed when it gets packed in for delivery. Now, since we've been doing this, we haven't had as many damages come back to us um, uh, with the cases uh, since you know uh, the. Well, uh, the on-island deliveries are not really a big of a problem as when we get them through uh, the library rate mailboxes because they have to ship uh, further distances and they pass through um, more hands. So I have this kind of, uh, this style of foam that I insert, but I also have these kind of foam inserts. And you've probably seen these if you've gotten our DVDs in delivery. These are actually more effective in, in protecting the case uh, than this one. Uh, however, um, this requires you having a very specific thickness of foam in order to you know, use this. And I have, um, I've created a template. And the reason the template is this shape is because uh, DVD cases now have this little um, flap here, which is usually holds in an insert of some sort. And, um, so that, that's what that, what that was uh, cut for. And so when this is in place, obviously it's gonna be the mirror, it's, it would be here like this. And uh, it would close on it and, it and so it gives more support and more protection to the case uh, you know, when, it, when it's closed. Uh, I'll show you how to make this kind because it's more, it's more common to find foam that is not the proper thickness to create an exact um, size uh, insert that you want. Uh, so I, I have come up with this uh, this style so that it, this gives us some protection and I've, I found that it still does a good job in protecting the case. And the reason um, I want to bother with it actually protecting the case is because sometimes when the case gets crushed in delivery, uh, here's an example of one, uh, you'll see that it's usually that the sides that, that go bad. So this is, this is actually on the top. And this, this side is completely gone altogether, broke off and it's just never, never made it. So what happens is um, this is no longer gives any protection to the to the DVD inside, and sometimes what will happen is the hub around the DVD 
will actually break and sometimes uh, it won't even play because it won't even hold in the DVD player anymore. And that's what the problem is, is actually not having a, a circulatable item. And then you've paid about $20 for a DVD these days and you only get to circulate it once or twice and then it's lost. And that's, um, and that's not really not very good use of resources. So I have here Harry Potter. I don't like these cases either. I usually take these and use these as inserts. Uh, so I actually, um, I don't throw these away either, the broken ones. What I'll do is um, I'll hold on to them, put them aside. And if I get a collection, uh, a circulating item like this, where we have a, a jacket that has a sleeve, I can just use this as the insert for that and not have to use a uh, perfectly usable um, DVD case. So I, I get rid of the problem of a broken case and it serves a purpose to um, be used on display. Because now this will be our display item on the shelf and then this the actual disc will be in our drawer and then be used uh, and, sit and kept safe locked away, whereas this will, will be on display for, for the patrons to use as a, a way to reference the material that they want to pick, borrow. So back to this. Um, <clears throat> if you do have foam, which is exactly the one half inch uh, thickness that you need to put inside of your case, you can, you know, you can uh, cut it down to the size that's, that I found is optimal, which is two inches by four and three quarters inches. My template then goes over that, and then I use a very sharp um, exacto knife, and I cut this pattern out, and then what I'm left with is this. Um, Therese was saying, oh, that must take a lot of time to do that. Um, not really. Foam is very easy to cut. You know, with a sharp knife, it goes very fast. And sometimes I do have downtime, and when I have downtime and I realize that uh, I have foam sitting around, I'll cut some foam uh, templates while I have some downtime and, and put them aside and then just use them as, uh, as I need. So that's, that's very helpful. Now, for this kind, I often get a foam which is too thick um, and it won't actually lay flat in there because it, uh, it's more than, a, uh, more than a half of an inch thick. So I've come up with this procedure for um, cutting it down to size. And what I have is I have, I have this tool which I made, which is a half an inch wide. And that allows me to cut a strip half an inch wide. And it requires a very sharp blade and a very sturdy ruler. So I'll park the ruler up against my tool. And then I'll take a length of very sharp blade. And I'll just do a couple of strokes just to get through here so that I'll get a clean cut and a nice thickness. And then what I'll do, I just cut a little bit a bevel off like that on that side. And then I'm gonna have to cut a little bevel off on this side as well. And I'm gonna get that kind of a chevron shape. And the reason is because I wanna put this in here and you see, I wanna be able to get it to go into the corner, but yet still clear this little flap. This little bevel is cut so that when it closes, the hinge will, will not uh, you know, butt up against it and then cause it to bend. And so now that will close and, and, and that adds some actual support here along the entire length of the, of the top edge. I'll repeat that process for the bottom and I won't have any problems interfering with the hinge. Now I'll use a, uh, a double edge, a double sided um, piece of tape. Just run it along the length there. And again, put it in there and just press that down. And now it's in there pretty strong and snug. So again, uh, all it takes is like for you to come up with something that has uh, the ability for you to measure out, you know, a nice half an inch uh, width of, of foam. And then uh, you can just get a sharp knife and a, and a straight edge and you can, um, you can cut some pieces and stick it in there. And then you'll, if you have one on each side, uh, you'll have some really excellent support and you'll find that your DVD cases won't come back as uh, damaged as often. And what really is we're trying to protect is the, uh, the hub and the disc itself. But you can also hold on to those broken ones because they, they do help to uh, you know, fill in the display cases if you have your DVD cases on display. This. 
if, there, if there's any questions, um, Charisse is going to be monitoring those for us, uh, and you can ask them, and then if I can answer them, I will. Right. Mark, you had one question, but I think you pretty much answered it. Lori Taniguchi from Kailua asked, why does it need to be a certain thickness? But then I think you sort of answered it when explaining how you need to need it to oh. close, right? R right, right. So it, if it's too thick, it will it will it will catch on, on the lid before it actually can catch here. Uh, there's a little snap. Uh, if it's too thick, it won't snap closed. So um, I find that uh, if it's a half an inch thick, even maybe even just depending on how dense the foam is, if it's a little bit wider than a half an inch, then sometimes it'll work because it will give a little bit and will allow it to snap. But the best bet is if it's a half an inch because that's, that's exactly how wide the case is on the inside. Okay. All right. So let me go on now to show the manga. And I got these just um, test booklets, books to use to show you. So there's nothing done with it. Uh, first thing I do want to mention is that, uh, so I'm going to be taping up the entire jacket. And that's, um, that's what was useful in actually uh, pre uh, preserving and getting some longevity to some mangas in our collection. We used to just tape the spine and then um, the leading edge of the covers. But we were finding that uh, the books uh, were getting so much use that right in the middle where there was no tape, uh, there was a crease forming. And then that crease kept getting damaged and damaged. And sometimes it would even tear. So when I saw um, our LA3s who were doing the repairs, struggling to try to cut a piece of tape that would fit right in between, I was like, well, you know what? Let's just you know nip that in the bud and we'll just tape the whole cover over. So I'm gonna show you that if you don't have Capco, if you don't use Capco as your branch, you can use book tape and you can actually cover the entire um, jacket and it will look just as good as Capco. I bought this little um, piece of um, label paper because I just wanted to put on the, on the video that you don't want to forget to put your call number. <laughs> don't forget to put your call number on your book before you start doing this. All right, so I usually uh, use these tape dispensers. I think they're excellent. I don't know if you use them in your branch, um, but I also have, um, two kinds, I, I, I'm lucky enough that nobody else here uses them. So I actually get to borrow both units. And what I do is I actually put uh, quarter inch um, markings on the edge here so I can see where my book lies and how much tape that I need. So uh, I start with the four inch width. And then with these markings here, I can just put like my book at the center and I could see that um, I need about, you know, my tape, my book to sit about halfway um, along the, between those marks so that I know that my tape is gonna be evenly placed. I know that there is a divider, there's a little marking on the, on the hinge part of this tape dispenser, but I never able to get it to work properly to, to make the tape line up. But if I do it this way and I bolt a little bit, um, I, get, I get pretty well, pretty well good results. So I'm gonna pull this out just to the edge. And I'm going to smooth it from here down. Cut it off. Push that out of the way for a moment. And now, uh, many of you will probably have a foam folder like that, that plastic one. They're, they're fine. Uh, however, uh, I was given this one as a gift when I started working here. And it's actually bone. You can get these at the um, art supply store. I find this to be much more reliable and being able to smooth down the bubbles in the tape. So I'm kind of like using a wrist action here too to work out the bubbles. All right. That's down. And now I'm just going to use my thumb to run along the edge here to get the spine flat. I have a hard time getting the phone tool to work on that. So I just use I'm just write that down. So and I'm just going to use my thumb to get this just to go around the edge here, but then I'm going to use the bone tool to get the rest of the depth. All right, so now also I get this little bit of excess tape here. Uh, we cut this off here. Um, sometimes you, uh, if you have a problem jacket, you could leave these longer and then fold it over to the inside of the, of the cover if you want, but we just, we just uh, shave that off. Shave 
to two. <clears throat> Now, most manga are about this width uh, across. So I'm actually able to use another strip of four inch tape, match it up to the edge of this tape and still have enough hanging over the side to, to, to fold it over. And then my book will be completely covered with tape and, and I won't have to worry about any uh, creasing of uh, having a, a jacket that's not, um, that's not covered. So um, again, what I do is, <clears throat> But this time I'm actually, <clears throat> excuse me, this time I'm actually going to fold it over um, and, and create a nice um, corner on the inside. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. So right now, all I'm gonna do is measure how far this book goes. Um, each side, I wanna have a little bit overlap. So I'm gonna double this to see, I made a, a red line here. So I'm gonna draw my tape out to here and then I'm going to um, use those uh, two, two lengths to fold over to the inside. So all I need to do is just really just pull out. This part is best done sitting down. And so because my uh, my book tends to move a little bit, I'm going to bring in a, uh, a bookend. And I would see, I'm just going to put it on the far edge there so that it holds the book flat. Now this part is the tricky part. Uh, I'm gonna hold the two uh, edges of the tape far apart from each other and keep tension on it because what that'll do is it'll give me a nice straight flat edge to butt up against the, the tape that's already on there. And so I'm going to uh, just look for the edge of the tape on both sides. And because I'm pulling really tight, it's gonna be just one straight line. And then I'm gonna push down. So I'm only gonna allow that one edge to be in contact. And I'm gonna get my bone folder in and smooth it in. So if I run my finger along it, I should not feel any seam because it's, it's butted right up against the previous tape and it's really good. And I'm gonna keep this uh, part up while I use the curve of the bone folder to smooth it down and then work my way towards the other far edge. And then of course, trying to use a motion here. There may be some minor bubbles. Oh, this one looks pretty good. But I'm telling you, uh, they're actually not um, bubbles. They're just that the, sometimes the glue underneath the tape is not even, but um, overnight it will even itself out. And you'll see if you leave it on your desk the next morning, you'll see that those little bubbles have worked their way out. Okay. So I have the tape hanging over on all the sides. And now I want to be able to cut that and get that to fold over and look nice. I'm going to bring my uh, bookend in back here. And I have a piece of a rubber band which holds the, the block of the book up. And all I have is the jacket free. Now I want to bring in my cutter, cutting pad. And I like to make a nice um, bevel corner here. So what I'm gonna do is show you that I have a, a metal ruler. And on the back side on the cork, I have a 90 degree angle marked on it. And what I'll do is line that up to the book jacket so that this edge is in line with this and this edge is in line with that. So I have a perfect square of a kind of a plus sign. And then I'll bring in my braid, cut that off. So I have a nice, perfectly square cut. Now this one, I already have tape stored here. So I have another one on this side so that I can do the opposite end. Way. I like to work with the leading edge first, so I will bend this over and then use my bone tool to move it down, working in towards the spine. And, then and now this one here, pull it on and then just push it. Same with this side. Now, 
So if my, my cut was good, these should look nice. They kind of like make a nice 45 degree angle in the corner. I still have these little bits of tape that are left on my ruler, which I can pull off and then use those to kind of like close up the, the corner there. Now I'm obsessed with this procedure. I, I kind of like, I think this makes it very, very durable. It allows the book to last a long time. The corners tend to, to stay pretty, pretty well preserved. And um, the jacket looks nice because it's nice and even you have a nice cover all the way around versus if you just tape the spine and leading edge, then you're gonna have a difference uh, uh, you know, of texture even uh, on the book. I'll repeat the procedure for the back uh, you know, for, to finish up the book and then um, the property stamps can go on and then it can be checked in for circulation, ready to go. This procedure, I actually um, uh, learned this from Gloria at Capolet. So um, give her a uh, thumbs up for, for teaching me and I kind of stuck with it. Mark, we've got a question from Kimberly. Yeah. She's asking, is there a reason that you prefer to use book tape over the Demco laminate rolls? Oh, um, I've never used the Demco laminate roll. Um, I don't know how well that would work I tend, I tend to see that books shift very easily. I, I, I just find it just a lot easier to, you know, to work with just to, just to tape it. And like I said, it was actually an evolution of process. It wasn't something that we had done all the time. It just evolved to this because I had noticed that um, the LA3s were starting to try to repair books by trying to fit a piece of tape into there. And it didn't make sense to have to circulate books where they knew they were going to get damaged. And then so it just, it just became something that was a regular um, procedure now. So um, I can try using the roll. I don't know how successful it will be, but I'll try and I'll, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, uh, any other questions? We can also, um, if we have a little more time left at the end, we could take more questions. But I wanna thank you, Mark. Um, that was really good. And we've got a lot of people comment saying this is really, that's really smart and ingenious. And um, I just want to say that Mark had, had taught me how to process. Uh, a few years ago, I didn't have a a library tech my library and so oh. I, I didn't know how to do all that so so having mark um he showed me some of his tricks and they were really good um okay. i also wanted to before we move on to cynthia um i also wanted to say for those of you who are like well dvds like who's still watching dvds um i want uh dvds and av is actually pretty expensive to buy from from the public libraries um and our budget for instance for why for av is about like 300 400 dollars and which can easily uh be spent up real fast and so um learning how to preserve these things are very important another thing to consider is what what it takes to stream. Like for a lot of us, we may have Netflix accounts, Disney Plus accounts, so we don't have a DVD player. For a lot of our patrons, um, you know, they may not have the components needed for, for streaming. For instance, you need a smart TV, you need a, a good Wi-Fi internet, that's a monthly bill, and the streaming. And so for a lot of us public libraries, um, DVDs goes really fast. It's one of our popular, <laughs> DVDs still king in the public libraries. And as Catherine says from Pahoa, um, AV, uses AV is, is crazy. Um, so um, go ahead, Mark, sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I just wanted to, um, just in case anybody wanted to know how to make this, um, this, this 90 degree angle on a ruler if they want to try this procedure in the future. You're going to need a, um, an, an isosceles uh, triangular uh, tool, which is what I use. And I'll, I'll just do that procedure really quickly before and then if you don't mind, then we can, we can move on if you'd like. So uh, you need a Sharpie marker. And what you're going to want to do is you want to rest your ruler down and the, and the tool flat on your tabletop uh, and then put your first mark where you want your triangle, um, triangle to be. So, uh, so just so you, um, to show you, I'm just going to tilt it for now, and I'm going to put my mark there. And then, um, because this is over the top, uh, it's obviously I'm not going to get a 90 degree angle by tracing the opposite side. 
Uh, I do want to just shift it over until the first uh, mark is is in contact with the edge of the tool and, and then draw the next one. And then you're going to have your perfect 90 degree angle, which is going to be then perfectly flat to the surface so that if you do want to um, try and get a nice cut, uh, that, that really helps. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it's not necessary that it's perfectly uh, square to the, to the ruler, uh, but I find that um, the result um, is much better uh, on, the, on the book. And I get that, uh, that design eye from, from years of working in a design library in Savannah, Georgia. So uh, it's always appearances and then functionality. <laughs> Okay, so I think I um I am finished here. So if Sharice, if you would like to introduce Cynthia, yeah, um, no problem. Have her presentation. That'd be wonderful. Excellent. Thank you again, Mark. Mm, thank um, you. I'm going to switch over to uh, me. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Hi, on. Cynthia. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. I'm still learning Zoom despite being in this <laughs> for um, wait, hold on. for like three years now. It is so much work. Um, my pro a little bit different. I'm going to be looking at how you can monitor your environment um, and your collection spaces. But what this also helps is um, processes and efforts like Mark will, by understanding your space, these processes and processing books um, have the best chance of surviving in your collection space. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit about environmental monitoring and integrated pest management systems and how to implement something like this in your library or archives on a shoestring budget. Um, we'll also talk about the affections of the or effects on the collections, excuse me how you take that data or your readings to compile and analyze it to better understand this space. Um, and if you already have a pest management and environmental management system in place at your institute, congratulations. But I hope you can still walk away with um, a little bit of a bit on how to better analyze your data or show that in ways to become integrating into more a sustainable approach um, for mitigating risks and long-term long preservation. Um, so I am starting the presentation on the assumption that everyone has, oops, excuse me, a little bit of a baseline on what environmental monitoring and integrated pest management systems are. However, I will briefly touch on each of them as we move through the presentation. So environmental monitoring is pretty much monitoring your environment. It is the baseline for all collection of data and information that allows you to understand your buildings, your systems, and develop guidelines and policies on how you can better care for your collections and understand the needs of your collections and your library material. It ultimately measures and documents temperature, relative humidity, and dew point. So what this is in a very nutshell situation is our temperature in America is uh, measured in degrees Fahrenheit. It will be your concrete number. This is how much heat is in the air at the exact moment. Uh, your relative humidity will measure the water vapor in the air compared to how much that air can actually hold. Your dew point is very similar to your relative humidity. However, it also pinpoints the lowest temperature that dew point will start forming. And this will allow you to know about condensation on your building as well as the books. Um, is your high back system too cold and so forth. So dew point can become an important part in understanding it as a whole. All three of them are pretty much an interrelated relationship that lets you know the temperature of your surroundings and how that temperature feels to you and your collections. If one increases pretty much the temperature, then the other does as well and vice versa. So your environmental effects on the collection. So what this means is the conditions, that temperature, that RH, um, the dew point will affect your material. And there's a lot of criteria and standards and information that are out there that gives you something like a target goal 
or what you should keep your collections at um, or around. For the most part, North American standards suggests a 70 degree Fahrenheit with a 30 to 50% RH. This will come up a little bit later in our presentation when I talk to you about starting to understand what this means and how it relates to your space. So pretty much your dimensional change happens with your temperature. If your temperature is too high, your objects will expand. If it decreases too low, your objects will shrink. So you have books, especially books and paper kind of expanding and shrinking and that will cause dimensional change. Your relative humidity is pinpointed more to your chemical reactions because that's the water in the air. And then what those two together represents is creating an amazing microclimate for our arch nemesis mold. So you really just wanna look at your 65% RH and keeping it below that. Otherwise you are gonna have to start to have bacteria to grow. Um, so how do you measure the environment in your space? So if you're at the top tier level, and I've only heard fantasy stories about this, your high back system monitors the gaps and does everything. You don't really need to know much about what's going on into your space. To so your second tier, where the majority of our institutes have data loggers, which is something like this, which will monitor the environment continuously and speak to a computer program. And the last level, is that, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, the last level is your don't give up hope. Even if you don't have money, you can still monitor your environment. And we're kind of at this level in Hawaiian Historical Society, and that is our hydrometer. So this unit will still monitor the environment and your relative humidity on a continuous level. The only difference is you do have to do manual readings. And um, that's what we're gonna kind of focus on today. These units go for about four to $8 per and they run on AAA or AA batteries. So um, I just also kind of wanted to tell you some pictures of the equipment. When I first started at Hawaiian Historical Society, I walked into all of these. Um, so the first step in your environmental program is probably, to, or not probably, definitely pick one and go with that one. Um, I think this one's is from the 80s and don't be alarmed, this is not working. So we're not at 62 um, RH in our collections. Anyways, so what that means is at this point, you have an equipment to read your environment. And um, now what do you do with that? What's the next steps? So you select your readers uh, for the $4 to $8 unit. Um, you know, your PIM systems can run you anywhere from a couple of thousand, one data logger is $150 or so. But with those units, you can really implement, um, we have about 10 of them or so with the batteries for a whole year, plus staff resources to manually record them. You're still, you're sitting at more of a $500 kind of expense. Um, but you do want to select the reader, determine the location and the units needed, and um, start documenting procedures. So in the next slide, I'll show you a quick little template that's easy to collect that data and what I call is your raw data or your readings. Um, but as you look towards creating this document and procedure, you want to write down how often are you going to take a look at these units? Are you gonna read them three times a week, every day, um, things like that. For Hawaiian Historical Society, we do about three readings a week and we pick one day where our public or our community is in here a lot. So our high traffic pinpoints. And then we pick a day where the collections are mostly closed. So it allows us to compare what happens when people are coming in and out versus when the collections are able to rest. Um, and then you also want to start looking at designating a staff member to do these readings. That's how that person will really know, start to learn your space is when you give that responsibility to one or a couple of people. And then you're going to take all that raw data and turn it into a report, which we'll hit on a little bit later on how you can compile and analyze your data. So really quick, this is our short read template. And all you really wanna do is make sure you have the location of the unit. You do wanna number them so you can keep track of them and whether or not you have equipment installed in that area, whether you have a dehumidifier or a high vac system 
or something that's controlling that environment. And you simply just log it down, but to always remember to keep your outside temperature to and your outside RH. So you can compare your in internally versus your external. And you do wanna always keep um, sections for the notes. So this is simply, it was raining a lot outside today to I am so hot. And this just kind of triggers your mind as you're doing these weekly readings to then be able to collect this data and move into your reports. Which leads us to our integrated pest management system. So you actually kind of need both in order to fully comprehend what's happening. Sometimes when your temperature is high, it's a great space for your pests to live in. So this picture is we're currently isolating some of our books and we threw in a silver fish packet to see if anything's going to take bait. Um, but you pretty much the whole point of an integrated pest management system is just to observe the potential threats that are out there, what might be eating your collection material. And the goal is to create low toxicity methods for vegetation. How do you get rid of the pests with the least amount of chemicals introduced into your collection? Um, so some of the effects on the collections is I picked the two most probably pro predominant in Hawaii is our American cockroach. So they love starch and cloth and paper to silverfish who love um, surface paper as well. Um, so equipment used. This over here is a great tutorial through Gaylord Preservation Depart um, vendor, excuse me. But these are gonna cost you about $200 for three months worth. Uh, or you can kind of do your long hoi hoi chop, I'm sure everyone's seen, which uses the same type of components and gives you the same results. And all three of these from sticky traps to roach traps to the silverfish will cost you about $50 for three months. So you're saving quite a bit of money within this. Um, the point, the perks of your sticky trap is the whole point of all of these is to catch your pests in order to see what they are. And that's what leads us to our monitoring and identifying. So you wanna do, um, pick your trap, place your trap, create those documents and procedures like you did before. Um, this is our Cardex. I had to throw in a picture like this because we are still running on lots of paper index cards to let you know what's in our collection. So typically around here, we put a lot of traps just to see what's happening. And so how you can do, even though you're manually reporting these, um, there is open software out there that will allow you to start doing data analysis and compiling this raw data and your observations you've created. Um, so real quick, here's just another template. So you just wanna make sure you have your date, your time, when did you look? If you found something in your trap and you replace it um, to how many pests you catch, what type of trap you're using, anything and everything is better. And these are just your quick notes on your weekly readings or your monthly readings. Um, which leads us to taking all that raw data and trying to make sense of it. So with your preservation, my favorite thing, hopefully it works, is this dew point calculator. It is open source and free to use, and it will provide you the same type of data as your data logger software program. So you're always trying to look for the dew point because it's hard to measure that. And you input your temperature 68 to 50. And over here, here will provide you an entire preservation evaluation of what's happening in your collection from natural aging to mechanical damage to is there mold risk, how many days, um, to any type of other chemical reactions or corrosions that might be happening. And you simply save your readings and then you can export them into an Excel sheet. And if you wanna turn it into a fancy graph or whatever's, that will really help to give visuals to your reports. Likewise to your pests, is there's this great online program that goes everywhere from identifying to monitoring to tell, let's see the image gallery, to telling you what is happening. You can look up these bugs They'll give you the scientific names, the common names, what type of it is, to everything from, let's see if I can find, 
Some of them will say high risk, you better figure it out now. Um, so these are just little triggers to uh, letting you know what's happening in your collection. And so ultimately what you wanna do is all these observations will amount into reports or opportunities that will allow you to understand your library, your building, your collection material. Um, by knowing a sense of where you are and the type of environment and pest relating um, observations, it allows you to advocate for your collections and space. Um, it allows you to test certain areas. If we up the um, humidity in here, what's going to happen? So it allows you to kind of be able to advocate and educate and empower. Um, people love data. It helps also to collaborate your facilities managers. They might be more like, okay, so we're getting more bugs this way. Maybe we can talk with you and turn on our AC over the weekend. Um, so data is really a great driver um, to understanding what's happening, which also leads me to the next thing and challenging um, a sustainable approach that's happening right now is challenging those North American standards on your target goal. And this is coming out of Australia um, Australia right now and looking at how you monitor your, your material in conjunction to your climate. Um, and so this is degrees Fahrenheit, but it's pretty much between, so I wrote my notes, it's like from 59 to 77. Um, so when you look more into the subtropical and the tropical range, those targets of keeping it be below 50 is really hard. And they're starting to switch and change that it's more about the consistency and eliminating those fluctuations than it is about hitting an unrealistic target goal. And so I tell people, wait, not yet. So I tell people, sorry, just a little prelude. Um, I tell people what this allows you to do, to give yourself time to really understand a whole everything that's happening in your library, your archives, you need a whole year. You have to work through all of our seasons and all of our problems and our wet and our dry to understand what's happening outside and how that affects us on the inside. And so I had to throw this last one in really quick on some of your quick fixes because um, I'm really proud of my Pinterest find. But some of your quick fixes is if you find that an item is bed bugs is a number one thing, um, you can bag it and put it in this tiny little mini fridge. You don't have to have something, or mini freezer, excuse me. You don't have to have something on a large scale. This runs about $55 at Walmart. And as long as you're hitting that negative 15%, zero to 15%, um, 15 degrees, excuse me, you, for about a week, you're killing whatever it is on your, your bugs. To so something that if you do have exhibits or displays in your public library, a great tip or trick is to buy these silica gel beads um, in mass amounts. You can get them from Amazon for about $60. You get about a gallon of them. And what they do is you, it's pretty much wet when you buy a brand new purse. You stick the packet in your humidity microclimate and it'll absorb all that extra moisture. And you can change the climate of your space um, by five degrees, you can, or by 5%, excuse me, you can get it within that target range. And so ultimately what it does is it starts off blue, it turns pink when it's absorbed, everything it's gonna absorb, and then you can bake it and dry it back out and reuse it for future uses. And I kind of, I found that recipe on Pinterest. So I had to end with a couple of quick fixes if you see immediate problems coming from your data. Um, excuse me. Oh, so for future reference, I know I shoved a lot of information at you a short amount of time, but when you rewatch this and you have access to the slides, these are a lot of the references and resources I alluded to, and a lot of those open source documents that you can utilize for your library. Um, and then, of course, contact information for me if you have any questions or you do want to reach out. Um, I'll also put it in the chat real quick, but um, I think Sharice had mentioned that she'll email this out as well.
then that's pretty much it. Hold on, how do you, oh, stop share. That's pretty much it. Again, I jammed um, a year's worth of research and data into 15 minutes. So please feel free to ask any questions um, or email any follow-ups um, or go back to the slides in the recording. But thank you so much for letting me touch on a subject I definitely geek out about. <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. That was awesome. Very informational. Um, so we've got some time left. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. I just want to say, Cynthia, I really liked what you said about um, bed bugs. It's also an issue sometimes, you know, with, for, for the public libraries. Um, and we do the uh, wrap the item up and put it in the freezer um, for a little bit. That's a good, good trick. But the silica, that's interesting, too. Thank you. Yeah, I actually read about it because they use them in um, gun vaults, like people who like who would have thought? I don't know. And then bed bugs is something I did. Yeah, I was like, okay, <laughs> well, we're gonna try it here. Um, but yes, with the bed bugs, I noticed that that is a primary concern, especially in public libraries. So yeah, I didn't throw that in as I was kind of messing around on that pest management website. Um, bed bugs pop popped up. So the good news, it does. It's no harm to your collection. The bad news is it just spreads with your patrons. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, you do want to bag it and freeze it. Laura asks, uh, did you say silica beads can be reused after baking? You, you did mention that, right? Yes. So, um, and I should have found the recipe. I, I can always share it with you guys, but you just bake it on about 250 degrees in the oven and it takes about three to four hours, um, but you can reuse it. I've noticed you can get about three uses out before the beads need to be replaced. Um, and there is kind of a mathematical equation with square footage. You, it's kind of a trial and error. Just throw in a bunch of beads and either like a cup or a bag um, and just kind of keep monitoring to see if you need to add more. But if you add enough, it should last about a month or so before you have to change them out. Uh, Lori Ask is, is the is a uh, preservation workshop for communities still available? Is that something that your association has have done before? We are looking. So this year we've definitely vamped back up um, our outreach programming and our educational committee. So it's something I'll bring back to the board, but hopefully we have some preservation setups happening this year and we can definitely reach out to you, Sharice, to put on your HLA. Excellent. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Cynthia or Mark? Well, uh, I don't see any questions, but um, I, again, wanted to thank everybody for joining and um, all of the information. Um, oh, wait, uh, Lori. Oh, Lori says you can go to Kailua, do their processing. <laughs> you want to take a trip down there? Uh, it's actually a really nice library. But I want to, again, thank everybody. Thank our pre presenters for coming and doing this program, a very interesting program. Um, this concludes our program today. And I want to thank you for joining us for this month's next Step program. Um, today's program is made possible through HLA members like you. Uh, to join or continue to support HLA, please check our social media and have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.